This week on Red Inca, we talk about that weary battle horse, Nashrafi Murtaza. One of my favourite cricketers, a man so strong and yet fragile, is like a powerful poem written on a cardboard drinks coaster. So we brought in the Mashrafi Whisperer to chat about him. Mohammad Isam, Bangladesh correspondent, ESPN Cricket Info. Isam's career as a fan, player and writer have all gone on while Mashrafi has played international cricket, meaning he's an ideal person to come on and talk about this cricketer and his 19-year career. Here we talk about his calmness, the India relationship, how Andy Roberts changed everything and what his legacy within Bangladesh cricket will be. Okay, so I've got you on because you are the Mashrafi Mortaza whisperer. I think, Isam, you may live inside his knees, which is probably why they are so bad. Your sort of career as a cricket writer and as a cricket fan is sort of overlapped with his entire career, which is about 28 years long at this point. You missed out on one part. I played cricket at the same time that Mashrafi did. And pretty much we started uh, off in the same time as well. So he made his test debut in 2001 and his test debut was his first class debut. So uh, I remember the test match. I was at the ground. Bangladesh were bowled out for 108 in the morning. And then uh, he bowled to Grant Flower and Stuart Carlisle. And he made them jump around. I think we have never seen that in a test match or in any form of cricket in Bangladesh till that point that a fast bowler comes in. He had a horrible bowling action. <laughs> um, but he really like let it drip. And, you know, seeing someone like Grant Flower, you know, get the ball, whiz past his nose, and then it wasn't a great wicket. So Mashafi was doing a lot of things, which later I found out that he really had very little idea about what he was doing. So it was just running in and winging it. Whatever he had learned from Andy Roberts in a seven-day session, that's what he was trying to apply in that test match. So yeah, I mean, my career as a writer, as a cricket fan, pretty much everything spanned throughout these last 19 years that Mashafi has been in cricket. You are the cricket writer that Mashafi built. I think is the way that they yeah. would say it yeah, in America. Yeah, yeah. Now, he's interesting <laughs> on a bunch of different levels. You already talked about the fast bowling, and we'll get, we'll get back to that a little bit. But he's also not from Dhaka. Now, for those outside of Bangladesh, uh, you know, you, you do get this in, in certain areas. I mean, um, Sri Lanka's obviously had a similar one at times. Quite often, when you're a developing country, and Kenya had this, was another one, all your cricketers come from one or two regions. So him not coming from Dhaka in Bangladesh is quite a big deal, isn't it? Yeah, it certainly is a big deal. And, and you know, he comes from such a backward sort of area in terms of cricket. I mean, Norail is way, you know, out of the way. Geographically, it's in the south of Bangladesh, uh, south slightly on the west. It's closer to the Indian border, a very functional Indian Bangladesh border. So he comes from a place called Norail, which is about 280 kilometers, I think, from Dhaka. Not a lot of great communication uh, because of the roads aren't completely built. Even today, the whole road is not built. There's a there's a large river that we have to cross if we have to go to that region. They're building a bridge uh, there finally. But yeah, I mean, going to Norail and not just going to Norail, coming from Norail to Dhaka must have been a huge deal for a kid of much of his age in, in the year 1999 or 2000. Because back then, not a lot of kids did that. There wasn't a lot of examples to follow you know, from that region. I mean, people wouldn't have known when he when he came to Dhaka, I'm sure a lot of people didn't know where Norail was. <laughs> Even being a Bangladeshi, you know, he had to explain where he was from. And luckily for him, I think one of the big examples for Norail was that there was a very well-known avant-garde artist called SM Sultan. He resided in Norail for a very long time. And uh, Mashaf, is from that place. And, and you know, people who um, knows a bit about Bangladesh, they know that Norail is a sort of a, a romantic sort of village, town, small town, where, you know, there's a, a river flowing alongside the town. You know, it, it's poor. From what I've heard from Mashafi all over throughout my time as a journalist, I've heard that they're happy-go-lucky, sort of very simple people. That's the thing. I mean, for, for someone to even have that thing in his mind that, yeah, I will go to Dhaka and start becoming a cricketer, that was not what people from Narayal would usually think like 20 years ago. Was it there that he started being called a naughty daredevil? Obviously, that's the English term, but was it at home? He used to jump in and out of the river and catch fish and all those sorts of things? Jared, I'll just give you one example of his daredevilry. So he was getting married. The day he was getting married, the entire Bangladesh team was invited and Dev Watmore was going to fly down there in the morning. So the airport is about 100 kilometers from Norail. Mashrafi took his car to the airport in the morning, waited for Dev, they came down. And when he got off from the car 
in Norail, they have said that I'll never ever get on the car with Mashrafi again. <laughs> he drives too fast. That's number one. He reached and just imagine that was the first time any f- cricketer from Bangladesh had gone to Norail. So he was very excited to show what was Norail all about. He started to climb trees, you know, to get the coconut. That's his wedding As day. As you do on your wedding day, yeah. We built that into our wedding, just me climbing trees. <laughs> yeah, so he apparently did those things and his father, his his mother, they were all really worried that, okay, get down from the tree. Someone's waiting for you to get married. But it comes from a childhood which was very free. His paternal grandfather and maternal grandfather's house were very close. So he grew up in both houses and in between the houses, obviously, there was the river. And the kid that he was, he was hyperactive, he told me. He says that his bones and his muscles move faster than he thought. He um, was just coming back from school. He saw something interesting in the river. So they used to, like, trawlers used to cross. So he challenged his friend that, uh, I can reach that trawler. So that was what he did after school. <laughs> Cricket and football came much later. I think for him, swimming, climbing trees, climbing about new boats that were coming in, just for the sake of it sometimes, he would swim upstream with the fish. During that time, it was a very good river. I mean, it had a lot of flow from both ends. So Chitra River was famous for being a little bit of a... Because we have a lot of dead rivers in Bangladesh. This was not one of them. This this river had a lot of flow. So Mashrafi used to be a regular, you know, swimming and jumping into the water. You see, you see, I mean, it's something that we all see when we are kids. We all tried to do but I think Mashrafi he got away with a lot of things and he got into a lot of trouble too I mean not just with his parents but with neighbors and and you know he always pushed the envelope I think as far as being a kid was concerned. So he becomes a fast bowler basically because he's athletic probably because of all the swimming up rivers and climbing up trees that he did. Now Bangladesh fast bowlers I think it was what 2009 maybe when Jamie Siddons coached the team and they came out here and he basically said at a press conference if there's any young English born people with Bangladeshi parents who can bowl fast yeah. come to our training that's not a good sign that you're creating a lot of fast bowlers so uh, Mashrafi must have been quite a, a phenomenal sight early on he must have been bowling about 10 k's quicker than the senior bowlers at that point he actually was a batsman to start off with. And then when he came to Dhaka, he gave a trial for an under-17 camp, which I was also a part. I was part of the 200 people that gave the trial and didn't make it. You don't have to mention your cricket career in every answer. <laughs> <laughs> so this is early 2000 and, and it's just a few months before Bangladesh got the test status. So they were about to participate in this Asia Cup and he played that tournament, batted really well and he also bowled like seven or eight overs in every game. So then they called him back into this camp for Andy Roberts. Trust me, Jared, that fast bowler was born in that camp. He tells me that when he saw Andy Roberts, he remembered all the stories he heard about the West Indies fast bowlers. I think that was the first time he saw Andy Roberts in person, which is quite natural because that was the first time Andy Roberts had come to Bangladesh. And you remember that Bangladesh had Gordon Greenwich as their coach. Hmm. 99 World Cup, yeah. So Gordon had laid out that foundation already that, you know, that bit of a flamboyance was there in Bangladesh cricket. It was Gordon who pushed that envelope that, no, 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 we should have cricketers who are talented, not just, you know, stodgy defensive players. We need players who could play shots. We need fast bowlers. It never materialized until Mashrafi, you know, met Andy Roberts and um, he was so inspired. That in those one week or two weeks, he just decided that he wanted to be a fast bowler. He played the league one season, I think, the Dhaka League. There was such a dirt in talent that this guy pulled up out of nowhere. He didn't even play the Under-19 World Cup. Didn't play Under-19 level, which is very unique for Bangladeshi cricketers. Because whatever Bangladeshi cricketer you see, they have at least played Under-19 cricket or that level. This guy skipped all of that. He was sent to India on an A-team tour. Midway through that tour, there was a test series going on. They said, come back, we'll, you'll have to make your test debut. As I said, first class debut uh, in his test match. And easily, he was bowling 10Ks faster than any fast bowler in Bangladesh at that time. And there was a lot of jealousy too among those who... I mean, I've heard a lot of stories. I've heard stories that he was bullied by other fast bowlers, the senior fast bowlers. Yeah, they made him wash their clothes. Mashavi has said it a number of times. He never names names, but I know who did that. But the point is that he rubbed the people the wrong way because of his talent at that time. He bowled very fast. I just felt that at that time, he was one of the few bowlers I had seen at that time who could actually swing the ball both ways. He later told me like a couple of years ago that, I'll tell you that whole story. It took him five years to understand swing bowling. No, actually not five years. 
I think more than that, seven years. Seven years into his career, he understood what swing bowling is. It's quite a unique story, even within Bangladesh cricket, isn't it? But because you hadn't had anyone like him in Bangladesh cricket before, you could see why he would be fast-tracked. And there was certainly, what would you say, a very conservative, very dour form of cricket that Bangladesh were playing at that point. Batsmen would be applauded if they made 30 off 150 balls, wouldn't they? It, it was a very rough time for Bangladesh cricket. And then in comes this guy who's become a fast bowler eight minutes earlier, and it's suddenly bowling quicker than anyone that has ever been. So you can see why he made such a big impact. But the biggest problem for him was, at that point, staying on the field, wasn't it? It wasn't just the skill. He just kept getting injured. Jared, into his second tour, he started in New Zealand, 2001. He was bowled into the ground by Khaled Mashud. Um, Khaled Mashud knew nothing else about captaincy, just to throw it to the best bowler on, in the park. There were two other good fast bowlers at the time, but Mashraf, he was very, very weak below the waist. I think it started off with an ankle strain and then slowly it built into, like he was not built as a fast bowler. He was thin, he had a bicep and all, but he basically wasn't built as a fast bowler. There was lack of knowledge about muscles and, and bone structure, obviously. Bangladesh had a few Australian physios, but they were always focused on the Bangladesh team. So what ended up was that Mashraf, he would come into the camp, play a few matches, get injured. They would tell him what to do until he went to Melbourne to uh, Dr. David Young, I think 2007 or 8. That's when he understood what his body needed or what was happening. And by then he had, I think, four or five operations in India. None of them worked somewhere in Bangladesh. He was abandoned at one point. I remember a story where Mashraf, he was in a Dhaka hospital and everyone forgot about him except for one cricket board member. He's a very interesting guy. He's still the board director. He remembered Mashraf. He said, where is that guy? I need to look at him. So he called up and no one could tell. And he was in a hospital bed. And Mashraf, he started to cry seeing him. He said, like, I've, everyone has forgotten about me. And he was an, he's an international cricketer. So a lack of knowledge about body, about fitness, you know, that also hurt him. But he doesn't blame anyone at all. He just says that if I had known better, I would have managed myself better and I wouldn't have done a lot of things. Just one last thing I'll tell you about this part. I mean, he had such little knowledge about his body. He got injured. He had a minor surgery in India, I think. Came back and he played football in the, in a muddy field in his hometown. A football or badminton, I don't remember. Broke his leg again. <laughs> Out for another eight months. The cricket board tried to hide it from the media. Like, they didn't tell anyone what he did. They said, no, no, he just got injured. But how would he get injured? And then that story started to emerge that, well, Mashraf is a very hyperactive human being. He doesn't sit in one place. Uh, I think the story was that he was doing skipping and then he was playing football and then he got injured. So something like that. Uh, it's incredible. And so going through that whole period, so from he makes his debut in ODIs in 2001 and through to 2006, he plays 28 ODIs. So in and out the side for injury, big gaps, sometimes just playing a couple of games. At that point, he's averaging 46 as an ODI bowler. And his career average is now 32. So for the rest of his career, he's really been a top-level bowler, hasn't he? And he sort of, he went from becoming a makeshift fast bowler with a terrible action into a very, very dependable bowler for Bangladesh over a long time in many different conditions. That point that you just made about 2006, that's an interesting time in Bangladesh cricket as well as for Mashraf. I think that was around the time when he first met Mohammad Asif in an Afro-Asia Cup tournament. Around that time, he met Asif and Asif actually saw him bowl in the nets and asked him, what are you doing? And Mashraf, said, brother, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> and then Asif basically, Mashraf, said it was like taking off a cycle piece by piece and then piecing it back together and telling the guy, this is how you make a cycle. He explained it to me once. So, Mashraf, he apparently was bowling in the nets. In I think this could be 2007. I mean, around that time, he was bowling well. And Bangladesh playing a lot of cricket against uh, Zimbabwe, Scotland and Kenya just before the 2007 World Cup. I think Watmore was trying to build a, a volume of cricket wins. That was his plan. Like, we'll play a lot of matches against these teams so that we keep winning. We have that winning mentality. And Watmore was right. They won against India in the World Cup and South Africa. But coming back to Mashrafi, so... Asif told him, so this is how you bowl an outswing. And this is why you bowl an outswing. This is how you hold the ball. And Mashrafi started to learn that. And, and Mashrafi says, even to this day, that you know, that one session taught him a lot that he, even now he uses the, those basic ideas. So he does credit Muhammad Asif. He always names him as one of his most influential characters in his life. So 
around that time he learned that and i think fitness was getting a little better as well he was still missing a lot of test matches one day matches but there was a lot of patience about him the the selectors didn't give up on him any time he was fit to play he would play even if it was just one match two matches he would come back play if he was injured then okay he'll go back so a couple of things worked for him also the fact that habibul bashar was the captain around that time that also helped because habibul bashar really trusted him so did dav watmore a very interesting i mean in the 2003 pakistan test series bangladesh lost 3-0 but there was one test in multan where they lost by one wicket inzaban played a great knock he didn't play that test match but he took two or three great catches as a sub and i still ask him he says that's one of my greatest regrets because watmore took me to that tour and said you'll play two test matches you pick Masha, we played the first one and he bowled so well. What we asked him, he said, no, no, I'll play the second one. Played the second, he said, that's it. You can't play the third test match. Bangladesh lost that game. If Masha, we had played, who knows? But some good breaks for him, some chance encounters, I would say. Asif was a lucky break for him. Yeah, so he broke through from that time. He was, I think he took 49 wickets that year, 2006. And uh, 2007, 8, he again struggled with a lot of injuries and... Another breakthrough for him, I think, from a mental perspective was 2008, Jared. So he was offered a huge amount of money to go to the ICL. He didn't go. Mm. He was approached with the most amount of money. I, I don't remember. I think it was 11 crore uh, taka. He was one of the first ones to be approached. He said, no, no, I'm not taking the money. I'll play for Bangladesh. Because he also understood that this was not official cricket. Yeah. And the thing was, the first match after Bangladesh played, after ICL players left, and Bangladesh played the first game. He was man of the match. I think he took two or three wickets against New Zealand, four wickets. So that pumped him. Like he, that's when he started to open up as well as a human being, as, as a cricketer. Yeah, this is my team. I'm, he owned this cricket team from that point. It's very interesting, like, you know, talking about all those sorts of things. I remember when Afghanistan were at the World Cup in 2015, and I was watching them in the nets, and they were literally being taught how to bowl cross seam. So they yeah. knew how to bowl seam yeah. up because you kind of see that on TV. But unless you played cricket and you're part of a proper cricket community, you don't learn some of those other little things. And that yeah. story about Mashrafi, it's, it's sort of a bit the same, isn't it? At that stage, it wasn't that Bangladesh didn't have good cricketers, that what they didn't have was a great cricket environment at every level so that you could actually end up as an international cricketer and still not know how you're bowling an outswinger, for instance. And those are the sorts of things that developing teams have that other teams don't. And I remember, I think it might have been that same tour where Jamie Siddons was the coach when uh, there was that big article around that the fact that Bangladesh only had three ball machines in the country at that stage. They still do. <laughs> How is that possible? <laughs> there are three ball machines. Andy Zaltzman has a ball machine, I know. mate. I know. <laughs> They're not that expensive anymore. But yeah, so you could see how all that happens. But as you said, he then takes over and it sort of becomes his team. The really interesting thing about him is that Bangladesh is not known as a calm cricket country, and yet he is this incredibly calm person. There's a great story about a rickshaw that you write about in your feature on him. So this is 2015. Mashrafi was coming to the ground from his house. It's about half a kilometer or maybe one kilometer. So obviously we all take rickshaws in Dhaka. It's a little unusual for you to think that the captain of the national cricket team would take the rickshaw, but he did. And while coming to the ground, a bus had hit the rickshaw. Now, Mashrafi is quite accident prone. I mean, we all know that he gets injured a lot. This was different. And uh, I remember the morning, his hand was completely bloodied. I arrived at the ground and I heard that something has gone wrong with Mashrafi again. And he was waving his hand with his whole hand plastered to me. He's like, yeah, again, it happened again. This is just before the India series, I remember. And there was a lot of people just, you know, scolding him. Why did you take a rickshaw? Why did you take a rickshaw? But then the story emerged that he didn't press charges against the bus driver. The rickshaw was ruined because rickshaws, as you've seen, it's very, breaks very easily. Mm. So he paid the rickshaw puller all the, like for the whole rickshaw, he paid him money. And the bus driver was like summoned to the police station and Master, he called them and said, no, 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 it's okay. It's, I'm, I'm alive. You know, just tell him to drive carefully. It's a very risky thing to do in Mirpur, take a rickshaw and cross the road. Rickshaw pullers are also not very careful, but... This is the guy, like the one thing that I really always observe about him was that he was very comfortable in his own skin. It's a very excitable nation. People jump to conclusions very fast. Mashrafi, he, he tells me that he was also like that. But all these injuries, his breaks, I think what taught him the most was the 2011 snub. Like he was injured, but he was getting fitness, but he wasn't picked. And he took it as a, an insult and he came back. And since then, he didn't miss a lot of cricket matches. So he, I think he realized that 
you know, not getting into stupid situations in the ground. He still dives across the pitch. I'll tell you one thing. Just came back from an injury. He dived full length at the boundary and he almost struck his head on a, on a heavy roller. He's still that guy, but he also speaks about how family changed him, family life, having kids, two kids, and his ordeal with his um, you know, wife's illness when the first kid was born. That also, I think, calmed him down. That gave him a lot of perspective. And, you know, he's very comfortable talking about difficulties. You won't find a lot of Bangladeshi figures. They'll shy away. They'll just talk about something else, which is okay, which is which I think all of us have our own weaknesses. But Mashraf, he just, he just wears it. He, that sort of calmness. I mean, if it was someone else, he would have sued the bus driver. The bus driver would have been gone by now. But he gets it. He gets Bangladesh, I think. That period, 2015, is basically where Bangladesh sort of take a bit of a step up. I think up until that point, everyone had hoped it was going to happen. And there'd been a few false dawns. When I first started Cricket with Balls, I used to refer to them as the Play-Doh Tigers. Because, you know, they weren't real Tigers, even if it was in yeah, their name. Yeah. And, you know, occasionally we'd, we'd yeah. sort of build them up and they'd crumble again. 2015 World Cup, yeah. they play some really good cricket, get to the knockout stages of that tournament. And then... It's a very weird time for cricket in general, let alone Bangladesh cricket. So you've got Mr. Srinivasan from the BCCI basically taking over world cricket at that moment. And the person who gets shunted, really, is the BCB chairman who was supposed to be giving out the World Cup trophy. Yeah. That becomes like a huge political thing. And then on top of that, there yeah. are a couple of weird calls. The one I remember in the World Cup final was the waist-high full toss that was a wicket yeah. that probably should have been reviewed and, and had a look at. Everyone in Bangladesh cricket at that stage, not everyone, probably not you, maybe not you, maybe it was you as well, felt there was almost like a conspiracy against Bangladesh cricket. And I remember this really clearly because Mashrafi could have gone down that, he could have easily given, there were plenty of questions given to him, and instead he went the complete other way. He was so calm in what was maybe one of the most frenzied, excitable times in Bangladesh cricket history. His main concern was when Bangladesh lost to India in that game that we have Pakistan coming at home in a few weeks, then we have India, then we have South Africa. He didn't want the World Cup to be a fluke. He forgot about the Rohit Sharma, no ball, the Ali, that thing, whatever. He it was like, a, I think most players forgot about it very quickly. There was one other call in that game. I think uh, Shikhar Dhawan took a catch down, around the boundary. Yeah. There was a question about that as well. It was the start of a bit of a rivalry between Bangladesh and India, if you can call it that. Bangladesh hasn't won a lot of games against India. But from time to time, Bangladesh reminds India that we are there. You know, we are, we are still doing something. That was the time when Bangladesh just beat England. They looked very good against New Zealand. And then actually it was a bit of a comeback in that World Cup for Bangladesh. They had a horrible year. You remember uh, Stuart Binney taking six wickets for four runs mm. in one game? Yeah, so that was 2014. Mushrik lost his job around that time, a few months later, and then Mashrafi took over. So also, Jared, you also have to remember that Bangladesh and India are so close to each other in terms of geographical location. We are we are covered by India on all sides. Mm. And there's a lot of a lot of border killings. A lot of Bangladeshi farmers, cattle farmers and all, they get killed in the border by the Indian forces regularly. So around that time, a few years ago or a couple of years before that, one girl was killed and she was hung on the border wall or the railing. Yeah. So that photo became very famous. Her name was Felani, young girl. And from that point, certain, you know, there was a certain anger towards India. I will not walk back from that. There was anger that this is happening and Bangladesh can't do anything about it. Economically, obviously, Bangladesh had to rely on India on a lot of things and geopolitically as well. There was always that, you know, official protest and people would talk about it. And that was big. And from there, that corner was turned about India that no, no, it was a public opinion, obviously. If we are to do something about it, we have to. And cricket became a vehicle. Cricket became a major vehicle. 2012 Asia Cup Bangladesh, you know, knocked over India. And in the media, I remember that day Tendulkar made his 100th 100. Nobody saw a ball of what happened in the rest of the game. Later, we found out that even the Bangladeshi players felt in the middle, no one was bothered about that game in the middle. Bangladesh simply just walked through that game, won the game by like four or five wickets. And later, like, uh, the Bangladesh made the final of that Asia Cup. Like, they also felt that maybe when he got that 100th 100, they took the foot of the gas. Maybe. So Bangladesh won that game and they had a good 2013. 14 was bad, but then the World Cup game happened and that thing was stoked. 
by ultra fans, I would say, that the, the umpire went India's way and everything. Leaving that aside, but that became a problem. Those small incidents became a problem. And then Mashrafi really took a very, very positive stance. He didn't focus on that. He later told me why. He said, as I told you earlier, the, his main focus was no. I won't let this be a fluke. I want Tamim to keep batting well. I want Shakib to keep supporting me. I want Mushfiq to keep batting well. And I want this fast bowling attack to do something at home. So he just didn't bother about anything else. He came home, calmly gave a few batsmen some orders. Do this, do that. You become fit. You do this. Do not go home and start eating a lot of biryani. He told everyone what to do. And luckily, uh, Chandika Hathuru Singha was an able sort of guy who enabled Mashrafi to do these things. Yeah, go ahead. Tell them what to do. Mashrafi went about with it. And I think that's where he's different from many other Bangladesh captains. Or He's not too emotional when it comes to taking a lot of decisions, you know. A lot of decisions he takes, he looks ahead, which, you know, it's very difficult in Bangladesh as a captain from a technical point of view because most captains are appointed for one series or one or two, like six months. He doesn't care. He looks forward. Like he told us in a million press conferences, look, I won't be around, but this ex-cricketer, like this Sabir Rahman or this Musaddegh or these young cricketers, they'll be around. So if I teach them something now, if I tell them something now, at least they can do something after I'm gone. So... You can say paternal or elder brotherly sort of thing. He always possessed that. And he always waited for a time when everyone would listen to him. And that 2015 was that time. As a general rule, people don't make bowlers captains, right? That's a thing that we all know is true. With them at that time, I suppose, Muhammad Ashrafal was obviously made a captain when he was still a fetus. We know how that went. (laughs) Shakib yeah. <laughs> looked like a natural leader, and, but was also suspended for pointing at his groin at one stage on camera. Still one of the great moments of Bangladesh cricket, if you ask me. Yes. Tamim obviously <laughs> has showed some talent, but he's known sort of as a very selfish cricketer at times, not in a horrible way, but in the way that some batsmen are, are known to you know, put themselves first in building runs. And Raheem, of course, was in and out as captain at that stage. So to pick a bowler as a captain, when also his body is made of, I don't know what kind of cheese it's made of, but it's its not a strong cheese, is it? Yeah. That says so much about the human being, doesn't it? He's not from Dhaka. He's a self-made cricketer. He had to learn the game at the international level. He's an incredible bowler, getting better even as his body is letting him down. But you know that he's not going to be in the team for any period of time just because he cannot be on, on the cricket field for any period of time. That shows what a special person he must be. Certainly, like he was highly rated when he was made captain in 2014. That was his third stint, by the way. He was first made captain in 2009. First test match, he fell and he got injured and Shakib took over. It kept happening for one and a half year and then the board said, no, we can't let this happen. And Shakib wanted a longer term as a captain. Shakib probably, he fought a lot about that. Like he wanted to be a captain for at least a year, you know, settle a team. So Mashrafi and Shakib, they alternated for about a year in 2009-10 and then Mashrafi was forgotten as a captain. But whoever knew about captaincy in Bangladesh always knew that this guy was a senior guy and he really cared. As you said, his human qualities was always in the forefront. Like he was that sort of a guy. So no one forgot about him. I recently read uh, Dan Brittick's piece on Tim Payne. That Tim Payne was supposed to be captain a long time ago. I think he was earmarked for captaincy such a long time ago. Mashrafi was a bit like that. But I think a little more prominent in Bangladesh. Like he did become captain, but because of injuries. So when he was made captain, he was probably the last choice. Tamim wasn't doing well. Mushfiq was about to be sacked. They wouldn't bring back Shakib and Tamim as captain, vice captain. They just thought, give it to Mashrafi. Let's see what happens in the World Cup. And then we'll see how it goes. A lot of it depended on his body. A lot of it depended on his fitness. I think credit should also go there that they trusted him. And with that, at least, he gave it back. And as a bowler as well. I mean, we now talk about how he's become such a crap bowler. Like in the World Cup, he took just one wicket for 312 runs. But he was the best bowler in 15, 16, 17, and 18. Anywhere he went, uh, in the West Indies in 2018, his wife was very sick before that tournament. He was the last man to reach West Indies. He was not even supposed to go there. Arrived three days later. Imagine the jet lag and all. He said that he will get Evan Lewis out. Got him out three times in the series. Bangladesh won that series. Led the team. And it was that tour when Bangladesh were bowled out for 40 odd in the first day of the test match. That was Steve Rhodes' first day on the job. So yeah, Steve Rhodes also owes a lot to Mashrafi. At this point, we are 19 years into his international career, which is phenomenal. But it's also worth saying that 
19 years into his international career, he's played 36 tests, hasn't played a test since 2009. How much of that was he literally couldn't play a test because of his body? And how much of that was them just moving on from him a little bit? Most of it was them moving away from him because immediately after that 2009 uh, breakdown, it was clear that he had to be restored for one format. You know, T20s weren't that big at that time. T20s were nothing. So by the time he started to play regularly around 2012 there, I mean, even he realized there was a lot of talk sometimes that he would come back, uh, maybe even with a shorter run-up. Even I once wrote a piece on how he could just be in that attack as a... Because, again... Bangladesh bowling attack in a test series without Mashrafi is, is nothing. They needed him a lot. They really missed him for the last 11 years. And there hasn't been another fast bowler who's taken his spot, to be honest with you. But yeah, I mean, much of it was like giving up on him a long time ago. And he also gave up a long time ago. Physically, he tried first class cricket a number of times. But it was always good to have him in one day cricket for Bangladesh because Bangladesh's strength is one day cricket. So that made sense. Yeah, he played first-class cricket in 2018, so he's still giving it a go. I remember quite vividly, and I think you might have written about this as well, but I remember Simon Duell once on commentary going through what he has to do in the morning to prepare his body. Yes. So I'm a bit of an expert on this. So I have no cartilage in my left knee, and I have something floating in my right knee, and my father has two knee replacements. In fact, I think he may have had one of his knee replacements replaced So I suppose that's three knee replacements. Uh, My grandmother had both her knees replaced. My uncle has had the same. I had my first knee operation at 17. What I'm saying is I know injuries in knees, and I know what it's like not to have any cartilage. And so my father would eventually, his legs would bow, so they would go out at the knees, and he would keep bowling. You know, He was still bowling at that stage, and he would bowl 25 over spells. And you see this a lot. You see former cricketers, especially before they have their knee replacements, they start to bow. And Mashrafi has had that bow at times. You can see his legs actually coming out. And that's because it's the only way to walk without the pain of the bone hitting the bone. Ryan Harris yeah, has yeah. had that. Uh, Andre Russell has got that as well. You know, there's a few cricketers out there. It's, it's an injury that happens to athletes because essentially what you do is you grind down that cartilage, which is the, the padding in between. If it sounds painful, it really is. And sometimes you'll hear a click from one of my knees. And my knees are good compared to the rest of my family. And yeah. you realize how bad it is. Now, I bowl leg spin very occasionally off about seven paces. I am not an international bowler. I don't have to bowl on the nets or anything. Can you take me through what he has to do in the morning, how long it takes him to get up and to get ready just to get to the ground, let alone to bowl at 10 over spell? So his match starts three days before the match itself. So basically he does nonstop gym. I have seen him do gym even on Eid Day. Eid Day is like our Christmas Day, you know. He would never ever miss a gym session because what he realized was whatever he has told me, his knee needs to be functional all the time. He needs to do certain cycling or something every day. So he doesn't have a gym at home, I think. So he comes to the gym and if he misses gym, he thinks he's half a man. He's like, he's not done something, not had his breakfast or something. So every morning he'll do the gym. So nowadays, because it's always a day-night game, he he comes to the ground, I think an hour or two hours before everyone. Then he does his taping. So first he shaves his whole leg every day. Like every bit of hair has to come out because it, it hurts otherwise. Then he puts on, I think, three types of tape and one black, I forgot what you, what you call those strappings, a large strapping with Velcro yeah, and all, I know what you mean. On, his, on the top of his knee. Yeah. Then one on his ankle. After training, I spent a lot of time with him. This is his day for every training session, not just a cricket match, not just an international match. So it takes it all out after the bowling session, replaces the taping before a batting innings or whatever, repeats it the next match or the next training session. So you can imagine him going through about two hours of taping before and after. Like I remember a lot of training sessions he ended, he came and sat with me or other journalists. He would start taking the tape off slowly, very slowly, talking to us. And he winces in pain and, you know, it's it's difficult. But uh, he, he talks us through it. Like this is why I have to shave. I don't want any hair over here because the tape won't fit. And if it tape doesn't fit on top of my thigh... It doesn't support my knee that much. I think all of this, a lot of it comes from Dr. David Young, this Melbourne physician who, I think he was Michael Schumacher's doctor as well. He's quite well known in the sporting sort of circuit. And David Young, I think around 2013, Dr. David Young told him that you might as well give it up. You can do something else maybe. (laughs) And Masha, he said, no, no, I'll, I'll follow what you said because he wasn't following a lot of things. I think when he started to follow it to the word, and then he also 
praises two uh, physios Bangladesh has had. I think one of them was Vivab Singh from South Africa. And he also praises the current trainer, uh, Mario Villavaran, because he needs a lot of time as a, for, from trainers, from conditioning coaches and from physios. He needs that attention because they have to understand his leg situation as well. So that whole process, I have not met him on the night of a match. I think I met him once. And that was after he was finished uh, taking the tape off. But I can imagine that whatever I've seen after training sessions and before training sessions, you know, he just comes to training, has a cup of tea, starts to tape slowly. Very slowly he will start to tape. He's got a few assistants these days who helps him cut the tape and, you know, put it on together. And then that large strapping that he has, the one with the Velcro, that is always in place. I think he can't really take that one off. I've never seen him take that one off for too long in training or in gym. It's incredible that he keeps getting himself out on the field and that it's it took until 2019 for him to slip back with his bowling. It'd be interesting to see where he's looked at in the future because as a cricket historian, you see these great cricketers who are maybe not great based on numbers, but on what they've done for their nations. They kind of fade away. Like if you can't see a bowling average of 25 and you know eventually Bangladesh is going to have a couple of guys like that and they're going to have some batsmen who average over 50, as all test nations eventually find. That there are really interesting early guys who don't quite have the records to match up. Like someone like Vinu Mankad probably doesn't get the respect he, he deserves in Indian cricket today because Sanal Gavaskar and Sachin Tendulkar and Kapil Dev came after him and Jimmy Sinclair in South Africa and Roy Dias in Sri Lanka and Bert Sutcliffe from New Zealand. There's a lot of guys like Mashrafi who on numbers alone maybe don't quite stand up. But they are the people that your you know future success is essentially built on. The lessons that he is teaching his players now is something that young kids are going to pick up the same way as the, the people within the team are going to pick that up and take that forward. You're absolutely right. That's what Mashrafi is like. He will slip under the radar from great cricketers, but his contribution is amazing. So that's why I always say that, you know, not in terms of cricketing skills or numbers, but he's a bit like Imran Khan in the sense that his presence itself presence in a net session or in a cricket team. I mean, he uh, is the sort of guy who saw Mustafiz in the nets and he said, no, 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 he has to play. No, 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 I will make sure that he plays. He would put his captaincy on the line for guys like Shomu, Tamim at their young age when they were not really pushing for the place or, you know, a bit iffy. They they didn't have the confidence. That's when Mashrafi came in. Not for Shakib. Shakib was completely different. Shakib is, is a completely different animal. Mushfiq Rahim doesn't really need a lot of uh, motivation. He is self-motivated. Tamim sometimes needed the push. Tamim has become a very good opening batsman. A part of it is Mashrafi giving him that confidence that, yeah, you set the tone, we will go with you. So Tamim really took that on board. And one of the great things about Mashrafi is he doesn't hog the limelight. He lets Tamim be the social captain of the team. You know, Tamim is the social captain of the team. I don't know whether I spoke to you about it, but Tamim tells the team where to eat, what to eat, because the team is completely dependent on him. Surely that's um, quite easy with Bangladesh. That's just Nando's. <laughs> yeah, but that's the easiest job in cricket. We're going to this Nando's. That's all. Literally, you look at your phone and work out what the nearest <laughs> Nando's is. Nando's is, I'm sure. But he, he adds a bit of culture to this team. So in, in Dubai, he took them to the to Salt Bay's restaurant. Oh, okay. You know? Yeah. So in Zimbabwe, I remember, this is like nine years ago, and Tamim was young. He explained to some of the team that, look, we are every day we're having Nando's or this and that in Harare. And Harare didn't have a lot of options. So he found out that there was a Turkish restaurant from one of the Zimbabwe players, took them there, had the meal and everyone liked it. So that's how it starts. And Jared, it, it gets to a point where Tamim's own life it has to take a backward seat because Tamim lets everyone come to his room and Mashrafi as well. Mashrafi's room is, by the way, that's another whole story. But Mashrafi's room is basically the team room. <laughs> but Tamim lets everyone come to his room, order food. Tamim, by what should we eat? I remember that in New Zealand, New Zealand, it's difficult to find good restaurants sometimes in places like Christchurch and all. Tamim would look through, like he he's the guy who's like, okay, we can go to Nando's, but why not? Let's let's try something else, guys, you know? So let's try something new. You know, he's that guy. And he also tells them where to, you know, he, he tells them how to behave sometimes. And Mashrafi has a role there. He tells Tamim that go ahead, you know, be my social captain, be the team's cultural captain, make them better, make them better human beings. And Tamim has those qualities. In a recent live that they do on the Facebook, Mashrafi said that Tamim, you know, set an example by helping cricketers, helping footballers, helping cyclists in Bangladesh, swimmers. I mean, Tamim just took it on 
he has unbelievable amount of charity work he has done and you know he has taken the lead in a way that he's seen something in the newspaper that one footballer was struggling to make two meals in a day contacted him somehow sent him money he's done it i think for the last three months i think he's helped around 400 sports people in bangladesh easily and i'm just mentioning the people from sports there's like a thousand others that he's helped financially or in some way or the other getting a job so mashafi is that guy he doesn't want all the limelight himself so in that way his inspiration also reminds me sometimes of arjuna ranatunga from the region and ranatunga is a very popular personality in bangladesh after the 96 world cup because before that jared ranatunga was a regular in dhaka league so everyone knew him as the oh he comes all the time international cricketer but he always comes when he won the world cup it was like one of our own has won the world cup mm-hmm. arjuna ranatunga is you know mohammedan cricketer mohammedan is a club here so ranatunga has that connection in bangladesh where people they don't really know him but they always felt inspired when he you know took on the umpires in australia that i remember we all felt like we are with him mashrafi is someone like that he would demonstrate that he stands by the weakest guy in the team you know the way he stood by rubel hussain during the world cup i wrote in that in that big piece i wrote about uh, mashrafi that no one was believing rubel side of the story mashrafi said no 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 i don't need to believe you but you're my teammate i'll help you mm. and then it turned out mashrafi and rubel were right it was an entrapment and mashrafi stood by rubel rubel went to jail mashrafi made i think a few thousand phone calls that day i remember his face that day the day rubel was taken to prison he was going to be in prison for 3 days or 4 days i think mashrafi he couldn't sleep at night he said my brother can't sleep in the prison i will not let him sleep in the prison and when when the weekend was finished rubel was out like mashrafi made sure the bail was done as fast as possible that's the sort of guy he is so i think as a performer obviously no one is going to remember him only the ones who have seen him play or have played with him they'll remember him but as a cricketer or as as a, as a personality in cricket he's really big i mean now that he's into politics that's when the imran khan narrative again comes back even the ranatunga narrative comes into play like so what is he trying to do i don't know whether you were there but uh, sriram veera asked him are you the next prime minister of bangladesh in one of the press conferences in the world cup last year and mashavi said no 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 you're going to get me killed <laughs> and sriram veera actually said if you become the prime minister please remember me mohammed isam thank you very much for coming on Thank you thank you Jackin but thank thanks a lot for having me. Thanks for listening. You can follow my guest at isam84. I'm also there. Please review this on Apple Podcasts or on each individual platform you use. This helps us. I think it helps us. Please help us. Patreon funds this series. So if you'd like it please pop over there and support us and thank you to the many who already do. Red Inca is made by me, Jared Kimber. Nick McCarriston pours liquid gold into your ear, and the theme tune is by the Red Cricket. Red Inca listener, don't forget to also subscribe and listen to Double Century, a podcast where I trawl through old newspaper reports and bitter books from former players to tell the story of our great game. Find Double Century in your podcast apps.